So let me, <laughs> it's going to just sound terrible, isn't it? <laughs> oh my. We're in our last week of teaching on worship. And we've been doing this uh, for the last month. And since it's been a couple of weeks, since our last discussion, um, I just want to bring us back up to speed on what we talked about throughout this. And if you remember when we went through this, we said that we're, am I working this? Am I going to need your help up there, guys? <clears throat> see if, there we go. We started out by saying that worship is surrender. It's the very most basic part. That's what worship is. Worship is surrendering to God. And so we looked at that idea that it's bigger than Sunday. It's broader than singing. And in fact, that our greatest acts of worship often occur during the week as we surrender and obey to God in our day-to-day lives. And, uh, and then what happens is Sunday just becomes a way to celebrate what Jesus already did all week long. So we looked at that, and then we took a number of stories of, uh, from the life of Jesus, if you recall, to look at what this looks like and, and how he's calling us to surrender everything, our mind, the, our mind, the things that we think about, a, will that, uh, a mind that sees things in light of Jesus, a will that says, okay, God, I'm going to do whatever it is that you have for me to do, and that serves other people the way Jesus did. And then Scott, a couple weeks ago, took us through the connection uh, between um, the, our personal um, worship and our corporate worship and how they're intimately connected with each other. So the way we're going to close and wrap it all up today is what does worship look like when we gather? So when we come together, whether it's on a Sunday morning, maybe it's in a life group, what does worship look like? I mean, one of the most fascinating things about traveling and being able to do a bunch of missions trip in my life is to be able to see how God, how, how, how different cultures gather. Right? You've probably seen this, you know, when you, if you've ever just been on a missions trip or have you ever seen a video. I mean, I, I've had the pleasure of going to Africa, and I remember being in Ghana and watching how they, how they worshipped. It was totally different. It was, there was so much dancing. There was uh, the sacrificial giving that they made. It was just the most amazing thing. It was really good. I've been in, in India where it was a much more subdued response, but prayer seemed to be so uh, highlighted in the midst of that worship. You've, if any of you have been to the Dominican Republic or Mexico, right? you've been in one of those services where they take their amps and they turn them to 11 out of 10 so that everything is just completely distorted and they just sing as loud as they can and it's just the way it is, right? And you see this over and over and over. Everybody does it differently. In some places I've been, people gathered for hours. In others, it was less. The common theme in every culture that I've ever, or every, every way that I've been able to worship, because even in our peninsula, it's different, was that they were worshiping Jesus as their risen Savior. And so even in our area this morning, as we're gathered here, the variety of expressions that is going on around us is, is crazy. Different cultures, different histories, different ways. People are... Uh, More charismatic, less charismatic. There's all kinds of stuff going on. So the question that I thought we would finish this with today is what does worship look like when you get together? I mean, is there a right way? Is there a wrong way? Is there a better way? Or maybe more to the point, when we gather, why are we doing this and does it matter what we do or how we do it? Scriptures are filled with examples about worship. You can't read through your Bibles without seeing it. Uh, in the Old Testament, the people of Israel would gather regularly. They would sing. They would pray. Not that dissimilar to us. Um, but unlike us, they had sacrifices. And they had priests. And so they would come, and then they would have to kill animals on their behalf. And they also had uh, festivals where they had to go live in tents. I mean, they, they had a whole bunch of things that we don't do. And then Jesus came, and he lived and he died, and he rose, and he ascended. And the church that he commissioned had certain core things that they did when they gathered. And so I want to go a little bit through what that looks like. When you read scripture, when they say, well, like, what's the bare minimum? Like, what does worship look like? What should it work, look like for us? And what we're going to see as we go through this, is this, this is the, the main idea for this morning, is that worship is a participation activity. It is not a spectator event. And we're going to unpack that a little bit. All right, 
Let me go through this. I'm not going to be talking quite as long uh, this morning because then we're going to do a couple other things. We're going to practice worshiping together, which fills some of you with dread because you're, I'm going to ask you to do stuff. It's okay. It's all going to be fun this morning. So what are the key worship elements? If we're taking a look at this, we say, what are the key worship elements? Well, number one is singing. Um, when Paul was writing to the church in Ephesus, he said this. He said, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And then he goes on to say kind of what that looks like. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. There is something about music that is critical to worship. Uh, music involves our emotions. It involves our thinking. It, it actually affects our wills. But we don't all come from the same place. So some of you have seen this video, but I thought it was appropriate. So let's take a look at this. And I know that each church has its own worship style, you know, which is cool. Some people are more expressive in worship, some people more subtle, and it's all good. Um, I go to a church that's pretty expressive in worship. It's, um, it's a hand-raising church. That's what it is, right? That's what, you know. Anybody here go to a hand-raising church? Anybody here? Sweet. Who here does not go to a hand-raising church? <laughs> some of you are trying. You're like, I can't. I want to, Tim. I need to get some momentum. <laughs> totally cool. But hey, if you're not used to going to a hand-raising church, you want to go and join us, feel free to join us, but don't feel like you've got to join right in, okay? Start slow. We've got a lot of different hand-raises that we use. We actually have names for our hand-raises. So I'm going to walk you through real quick, okay, what they are, just to let you know. Say you're my church, music is rocking, start slow, hands in the pockets, little elbow flap, you're fine. Very subtle. Get warmed up. Get your heart rate up. When you're warmed up, start with the first one. Ready? Carry the TV. Carry the TV. That's our first one. Very subtle. Go to big screen. Big screen, a little wider. Next one's my fish was this big. My fish was this big. If you're a liar, you go out there. That's fine. Don't worry about it. Jesus loves you. Grace. Next one's hold my baby. Hold my baby. Got dueling light bulbs. That's our next one, dueling light bulbs. We got goalpost. Everybody knows goalpost. Throwing a heartburn. A lot of people like to do heartburn. Double heartburn, right back to goalpost. What's my favorite? Mufasa. Mufasa, that's my favorite. The circle of life. Tim, can you go higher? Yes, you can. You take one hand, go a bunch of different stuff. Pointer, hatchet, schoolroom. <laughs> Release the doves, give the Lord a high five. Press it out. A lot of women like to wash the window. Wash the window. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. By the way, I've seen every single one of those, I think, in my life in church services. Paul, when he was talking about the need for singing in worship, says we have to have singing, but do you notice what he never says? Is how. He doesn't say what it looks like. He doesn't say what kind. He doesn't say what you should do. Generally speaking, the rule in worship when you're praising God is to try things that are a little beyond what you're currently comfortable with. And I say this from a personal experience because I grew up, as a lot of you know already, in a more... Um, Baptist background, there was not a lot of expression. If you raised your hands, the elders would probably come talk to you. Right? They would say, there's something wrong with you. So I didn't grow up with that at all. And somewhere along the line, someone encouraged me. They said, why don't you just be a little more loose when you praise? And I said, that's just not me. It's just not what I do. And they kind of pushed in a little bit. They said, well, maybe it should be. And so I remember, I, I mean, I can still think of it. I think the first time, I remember being on about row four, and it was I thought, okay, I'm going to raise my hand, and I kind of put it up there, and I have no idea. I don't think I was encountering God. I wasn't paying attention to the song. I didn't know anything about the words. I thought everybody's looking at me, and I was so self-conscious, 
Truth was, nobody cared. Nobody was watching. And it began a journey for me over many, many years that has changed how I worship. And so I'm not telling you how, but I am encouraging you to try something new. And the reason we do that, there's a surrender. There's a reason why this is a praise. Because you know what this is? I surrender. There's something about that that changes things. And so I would encourage you uh, to do that. You can get a chance to try that later. Singing, music, it's a huge part of worship. It's one of the things we do when we gather. But there's a second part, which is teaching. Uh, when um, you remember in the early church, when they were gathering and they had this kind of this problem because there were people being served. It was like the deacons were helping. They were doing different things. But it, there was some widows that were being neglected. And so remember what they said? This is the apostles. They said, brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We're going to turn this responsibility over to them and we will give our attention to the word and the ministry, prayer and the ministry of the word. The apostles would preach and teach wherever they went. It was part of the model they had for evangelism. They taught. Remember, Eutychus fell out of the window and died because Paul preached all night. Stephen was martyred partially because he was such a powerful speaker. Part of the Great Commission to make disciples involves teaching. He says, go teach them everything I've commanded you. So teaching is essential. What we're doing right now, this, this, this kind of this teaching is important. That's part of what we do when we gather. But there's a third part. Scripture. When, when Paul, the early apostles, um, took this seriously, and Paul, when he was writing to Timothy, he said, look, until I come, look what he says, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture and to preaching and teaching. In other words, he says, look, this isn't just about opinions. This is about examining the word of God. And remember, they didn't have the New Testament like we did. So when Paul said this, all they had, if they were lucky, was some of the Old Testament or one of the letters that Paul had written. He says, look, devote yourself, guys. Do this publicly. There's something that happens when scripture is read publicly. Examining scripture today that they would gather to hear the word of God read and hear it taught. So, singing, teaching, scripture, and of course, prayer. Prayer was a big part of worship. And, and when, when, again, when writing to Timothy, Paul was giving this instruction on how to worship. And he says, I urge, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, thanksgiving be made for all people. He wasn't just making a generic statement. This is in the context of him saying, this is how the church is supposed to worship when they get together. You're supposed to be praying. It was central for the church. They were praying when the Holy Spirit came down at Pentecost. They were praying when Peter was released from prison. They prayed when the church was persecuted. They prayed when they sent off missionaries. I mean, prayer was just a critical part of worship when they gathered. This is an interesting one. Did you know that when we do an offering, and, and by the way, just to be a little side here, you'll notice if you've been here for any length of time that we don't pass the plates. It's not because we have anything against that, but we do a lot of giving electronically. We put them at the front. We put them at the back. We want it to be part of your expression of worship because it's one of the things we do to surrender to God. Um, Paul actually was talking to the Corinthian church. He says, now look, about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatians. In other words, this is something he told multiple churches to do. To do on the first day of every week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, collections won't have to be made. What he's saying is, look, you guys should be sacrificially on purpose giving all the time. It's part of your worship. And when you get together, bring it all together. You can resource God's people on the mission when you do it together. It's why we do offering. It's why God invites you to give him because it's part of our worship and then lastly encouragement and fellowship the writer of hebrews you've probably heard this verse before he said let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds in other words we want to encourage other people to live a life that jesus wants to live and then he says here's how you do that by the way not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching in other words he says look if you really want to be encouraged, if you want to be pushed in your spiritual life, you do it with others in worship. It's where you share your burdens. It's where you pray over each other. It's where you anoint with oil. It's where you call the elders of the church. Because I'm telling you, there's something about hearing from another person, having them listen to you, give you a hug, 
and just pay attention to you that's invaluable. Now, there are other things that we do to kind of fit in this. Obviously, we do communion. That's kind of part of the fellowship and the encouragement and remembering Jesus. We do baptism, which is actually part of the, the preaching of the word and then seeing people respond to it. But when you read through the New Testament church, this is what it meant when they gathered. Here's where we've gotten it wrong, I think. It's not just a participation activity, it's a communal activity. Do you notice that almost every single thing he said in there is we're all supposed to be doing? Look what he says. He's talking to the Corinthian church again. He says, and I think Scott used this verse two weeks ago. He said, what should we say then, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. And then he says this, everything must be done so that the church may be built up. One of the dangers in our culture is that worship has become something we consume. And when we gather, we listen. And if we were honest, what we would say when we left is, it was a good concert today. I really like those songs. And then we go on our way. And yet every single thing we see in here says, you're supposed to be doing this with each other. You're supposed to be building each other up. You're supposed to be engaging with each other so that when people leave, they are encouraged, that they are challenged, that they are loved. You know, the best worship involves everyone. Every one of you comes here on Sunday with something to offer. Every one of you. And whether it's in your actions, your prayers for someone, just how you sing. You know that when I said earlier about using your expression and singing? That expression often isn't for your benefit. It's for the benefit of the people around you who are actually encouraged by you. Maybe it's just your friendly smile. Maybe it's the fact that you're a hugger. Maybe it's how you serve other people. It's all worship for the building of other people up. Because I don't know if you noticed, but every activity we just looked at there was in the context of community. He said, when you sing, what were you supposed to do? You were sing to and with each other. When he said teaching, it's like, it's communal. I want you to gather together. I want you to teach. I want you to uh, learn together. It's why we learn best when you can hear something and then pull it apart. It's why we do life groups. Because you can't always have that discussion in a big group. There needs to be a place where you can pull it apart and say, well, how does this apply to me? Scripture was to be read public. Because when you hear someone read Scripture, when you hear them pulled apart, all of a sudden you hear it in a different way or God speaks to you in a new voice when you do that. Praying together is a non-negotiable. It's why we've been talking about it all year and praying for people and praying over people and asking people to pray over you. The early church prayed together out loud all the time. And giving was all about people, helping each other, supporting the people around you, helping them with their physical needs and just being for them. And quite frankly, encouragement can only happen in community. You cannot get these things watching on your television. Can't be done. Here's why this is so important, and then we're going to practice. Because some days you will come here and you will need to be the recipient of all these things because your world is broken. Or you just had a miserable week. Or you are not in a good place. And you need to be with God's people in worship where the reading of Scripture and the teaching and the serving and the encouragement are all coming into you where you say, oh, that's what my soul needed. And by the way, if you ever wake up in the morning and think, oh, I really don't want to go to church today, that's when you need to go. You all know that because whenever you've done that, you said, oh, I'm so glad I was there. And then there will be other days where you come and you're the one who's the giver, where life is okay, life is good, your heart is full. And the way you interact with others and the way you worship will fill those people up who needs it. That's why God stuck us together. Worship in Scripture is more about the collective than it is about the individual. We live in a hyper-individualistic society in the West. Every single one of us. And whether you think you've gone past it, we, you, you haven't because it's just it's our culture. If everything's about me and my personal walk with Jesus and my personal worship and my personal... That's fine, but do you know that Scripture actually says more about us than it does about you? And that's because there's synergy, there's energy, there's multiplied impact. 
And when it comes right down to it, worship is a participation activity. We embody Jesus more together than we do alone. So there are some barriers to this uh, because, too, uh, sadly enough, this isn't the norm uh, for a lot of us. Um, you guys are fantastic. I love coming on Sunday. I love gathering with my life group because people do these things. Unfortunately, sometimes busyness actually stops this, right? Because busyness makes it so we don't even gather. We're like, oh, it's just so busy. It's been such a crazy week. I'm just staying home. I'm not going to life group. I'm not going to church. Busyness gets in the way. There's just so much going on. We don't have the energy. Sometimes just the seasons of life make it difficult. If you ever had kids, you know how much more difficult it is if you're trying to wrestle four kids out the door to get to church in time. It's not quite as easy as when you're retired and you're like, why isn't everybody here at 8.30? You're all awake, right? Sometimes it's just simple things like pride. Most people I know that won't express themselves, won't pray out loud, and won't raise their hand, it's because they're too proud. I've actually met very few exceptions to that rule. Sometimes it's just a lack of knowledge. They've never been taught. We haven't learned. What does it look like to worship together? And sometimes it's a lack of opportunity to try those things. But worship's a participation activity. We actually get to choose all this stuff. We get to choose to worship. We choose the degree to which we're going to engage in singing. We choose whether or not we are going to give sacrificially. We choose whether or not we're going to be teachable. We choose our willingness to be prayed for, to pray over other people. We choose to encourage or to be encouraged. It's all your choice. But as we said way back at the beginning, when we surrender, that's what happens. We surrender to what he desires in us. And so this morning, we're going to apply this. Okay? That's why I didn't speak really long. Um, well, the verse talked about encouraging each other with the word. And so Mark, my trusty assistant, think of him as Vanna White. <laughs> He's going to walk around with the microphone. And the reason what we're going to do is this. All of you just, or a lot of you just spent an amazing time in here during the 40 hours of prayer. And you encounter Jesus. And there is someone here who needs to be encouraged by what you experienced in that time. If your time was anything like me, it was just wonderful. And so you get a chance to share. So he's going to bring the mic to you. You don't have to come to the front. Um, but we want to be able to hear you. So put your hand up. He's going to come to you. And we're going to take a few minutes to be encouraged together to follow exactly what he told the Corinthians, which is share with each other an encouraging word from God. So... Put your hand. Mark's coming. So this was my second time that I was able to do the 40 hours of prayer. Um, and the first time, I just went in and kind of prayed on my own. But this time, I did kind of the, the guided thing. And I must say, just taking time to listen to God is so important. Um, taking care of my three kids, I don't really have a lot of time to myself. And so that hour was incredible to just sit there with God. But during that listening time, he told me so much. It's so important that after we pray that we sit there and listen and just take time to listen. And so one of the things he told me was be sensitive to the spirit in hearing me. And so mm. it was just really encouraging to hear that. So good. Someone else. This is the second time it's been offered and the second time I've done this also. And I love it. I choose the early morning hours because I'm tired when I come in. And my heart is quiet. Um, I'm not sleepy, actually, when I come in. And actually, I was pacing around and praying, which I tend to do. When I'm walking, I can pray. It's easier. I I can focus better. And there was a newbie in here with me. And at first I thought maybe she would be offended because I kept leaving her and walking away. And I explained to her that that made it easier for me to pray. So I was walking the halls. And I ended up in the chapel. And that's where the quiet really hit. And it's... It was so nice because you can listen, you can actually 
here in the silence or feel the love. And, and it's where I could really concentrate on the things that I'm not doing as well and should do better. And, you know, false promises that I've made and not kept. And it was really a time for me to really dwell on the things that, that I need to do just to show God that I do love him, that I do want a closer relationship with him. So if you haven't done it before, look forward to next year because it's really worth it. And, and I'm sorry I didn't sign up for more hours. Mm. One hour I thought would be long, and it always turns out to be too short, just so you know. <coughs> Thank you, Sue. I know there's lots of stories. Put your hands up. All right. Fill us then, Scott. The older I get, <clears throat> the more distracted I seem to become. So for me to have the circle up here with specific things to pray for was very, very helpful. I spent a lot of time up there. But I also appreciated the opportunity to take communion by myself in the prayer room. And that was just a wonderful time. That's good. You're working me. Okay, this is the moment of truth. I signed up and I thought, what in the world have I done? <laughs> I do pray and I do believe in prayer and I thought, God, I have to have the right attitude to do this. And I thought, what in the world? Well, I, I mean, I pray, but to come in here and not, before I got here, not knowing what I was going to pray for or pray about. But they did have a nice booklet that you could go by, and it was very helpful. And the hour flew, and Esther was with me. We prayed together. It was just very beneficial, very helpful, and I'm so glad that I did it. Mm. You know, first year and the second year we've been hearing these testimonies like this, uh, an individual base. This year I asked our life group if we would, uh, they thought we could do it together as well as individually. We did it separately and we did. And I found it to be really, um, it was different in a sense, obviously you're not by yourself, but I really enjoyed it. Now our group is a small group. We don't have a large group. So it was very intimate, but it was just nice to do all what you're all saying. But we did it in our life group together and I found it extremely uh, meaningful. I think in a, a dynamic, dynamic way. I believe it drew us closer together with each other as well uh, in doing that together. I really mm. appreciate it. That's good. A couple more. Our family got the opportunity to come in this morning, and um, it was us and the six kids and, um, you, you know, it, it was unique at that uh, Jody and I didn't have to do a whole lot, but just ask questions about Jesus. And the kids' responses were just remarkable. Hmm. And um, talking about their identity, the way God loves them, the people that they need to pray for, the world in which we live, the intercession part. And to hear the kids' heart for the world, for the church, for their family, for healing, for engagement, was nothing short than they're just beautiful. And I would just encourage you, as you continue, not just in the 40 hours of prayer, even though that was a set time, that you never know what Jesus will be willing to do if you just allow yourself to be vulnerable in his presence. And these kids just absolutely ate it up. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Jody and I were just parents just saying, God, thank God they're not following after Jody and I, that they're following after him. And so we thank God for that. I... Uh 
before I get started, I'm a crier. I was born like this. <laughs> and you can ask the ladies in my Bible study group that I'm with, I tend to cry easily. And I'm from a church that uh, we did this almost every Sunday. There was always somebody popping up and saying, let me tell you what Jesus has done for me today. And uh, I have often thought, Lord, forgive me, and I hope you all will forgive me. I have often thought, what would these people think if I stood up right after a song and said, let me praise Jesus let me just thank him for all he's done and is doing for me. Would they throw me out? <laughs> so I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, Elaine, if you don't stand up and tell people how much Jesus has done for you, then that's going to be a point for Satan. So that's why I'm standing up here. It was the first time Ronnie and I did this 40-hour of prayer. And pastors and all of you that have mentioned it about music, it's so true. As I came expecting God to be here and to bless me in the way that I needed it and to show me what I need to change in my life. And this is the beginning for me to stand up here. And he did. And I praise him and thank him today for that. That's thank all. <clears throat> Amen. That's great. By the way, you're totally free to do that. If God's ever speaking to you in the worship and you want to get up and share, just come talk to me. I'll put a mic in your hand anytime. There's something about hearing that God's at work in more than just one place. It's just so encouraging. I came in last night. I prayed in the middle of the night, early morning. And I was tired. And I had a particular issue on my mind. And God always shows up. Because instead of going into that, I actually felt led to go into repentance. And it was in repentance that he answered, the prayer that I hadn't even prayed yet. And my friends, that's, that's what Jesus does all the time. And I'll just share with you, and then we're going to take a chance to actually pray. I was sitting right here, it's the middle of the night, and I looked up at the stained glass behind me, and it was dull and black and gray, and you couldn't really see very much. And it was like Jesus said, yeah, you know when it becomes beautiful? Do you know when you can see everything? Do you know when that becomes everything it's supposed to be? It's when the light shines through it. So if you want to be the man, the person that I created you to be, it's only going to happen if you let me be the one. And it became a significant thing. What I'm telling you this is because when we worship, when we listen, when we share with each other, Jesus delights in meeting with you, speaking with you, encouraging your soul, convicting you, as you heard from people this morning, never in a bad way, but in a good way. So that's what we want to be. We want to be a church that worships by surrendering our lives all week and then comes together to celebrate the Jesus to whom we're surrendering to.